Okay, um, so let's, last time uh, we talked about the Cauchy stress tensor and we proved that it's uh, symmetric uh, and, and uh, essentially um, uh, we also showed its sort of existence. And as the, the idea is that the, in general, the traction as an Eulerian field, let's say, is something that depends position and time, but also on the normal to the surface on which that traction lives. And uh, now we are expressing it in terms of the Cauchy stress tensor at a given position and time. That's all it depends on, and the normal appears independently. Um, so clearly, the uh, Cauchy stress tensor is something that lives in the current configuration, right? This is a something that lives in the current configuration, and so is n. So it maps something from the current to the current configuration. So both of its legs must lie in the current configuration. So it's T i j e i bun e j. And uh, we should notice that it is a symmetric tensor. So in general, it has six independent um, components. Um, and eventually, it gives rise to the traction on the surface as such. So let me draw um, a surface with an arbitrary normal. So let's say an arbitrary surface with normal n. So this could be our surface. Like we're looking at a point on the surface, and of course the surface itself could be curved, but I'm just going to, for convenience, imagine as though it's locally almost flat, and the normal to the surface is in that direction, right? Um, now, what we should realize that eventually, when you calculate the traction through this expression, the traction itself is not necessarily something that lies normal to the surface. And we've already seen that when I was trying to link the expression for the Cauchy stress tensor components to the usual components from undergraduate mechanics. We were looking on a surface, and on that surface there are three components of the stress, the normal and the two shear components. And therefore, when you put them together, you get the traction, um, traction vector, if you like, and that vector is not going to be, in general, normal to the surface. That is T. So it will have a normal component, and let's say that the normal component is actually sigma n times the normal, and the tangential component is, let's say, tau. So in other words, I could, in general, decompose t equals tn uh, into a normal part and the remaining tangential part. Um, so if you're interested in finding out what those normal and tangential parts are, all you have to do is first you can extract the normal part. Uh, that's rather easy. So what I have to do is I need to take um, the component of the traction along the normal direction. But T is Tn, if you like. So you can also plug in uh, the expression for the traction, so that's what sigma n is. And then the remaining tangential part is simply obtained by subtracting the normal part of the traction. Okay? So the message here again is to highlight that the traction is not necessarily normal to the surface. It has a normal and a tangential uh, component. Now similarly, um, the stress, when we talk about the stress, the stress will have six independent components. And all of those components, in general, can be uh, non-zero. But uh, let me just mention in passing a few particular types of stress forms or states. And, uh, well, I'll just mention three. The first one is a spherical state of stress. So that would be something that you could associate with pure pressure. So spherical, remember, 
means a spherical tensor is identity times a scalar. So in this case, uh, the stress tensor is going to be a scalar, and I'm going to write it as minus a pressure. Okay. And uh, if you're interested in finding the traction field for such a state of stress, now obviously T is equal to Tn is equal to minus Pn for every n. Okay, so no matter which surface you look at, there is only a normal component of the, of the traction, and that is a, a compressive type of load per unit area, and P would be the corresponding pressure. So in matrix form, T would be like this. Okay. Where all the octagonal terms are zero. <coughs> so that would be the first one. Now, then you could have a state of stress where you again only have diagonal components, but those components are not equal to one another. Uh, that would be a case where you have um, uniaxial, biaxial, or triaxial, let's say, um, tension or compression, depending on whether the stress is. Uh, positive or negative. So I'll just write it like this. So I would have sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3. All the remaining components again are 0. What you might have is only one of these being non-zero. Let's say sigma 2, these are 0. That would be uniaxial along direction 2. Or you might have only two of them non-zero. Or you might have all of them non-zero. And they don't have to be equal to one another. And that's another state of stress that is uh, common. Okay. And finally, yet another state of stress that um, one might be interested in is simple shear, where now you have all the diagonal components equal to 0, but the off-diagonal components, which have to do with shear, are non-zero. They might all be non-zero, or only some of them might be non-zero. All right, so now at this point, we have a, um, that's sort of like a summary and a little bit of extra information on, on the stress. So what we have so far is, right, um, in terms of balanced laws, that's the topic of this set of lectures, right? Um, so we have developed the, for the linear and angular momentum balance, the spatial, right, forms of the balanced laws in integral and local form. Okay? And in doing so, the Cauchy stress was something that appeared as a uh, key concept. Right? So now what we would like to do is just like we've done for the mass balance, and uh, uh, just like we've discussed several times, right? there are always two configurations, the reference and the spatial one. The spatial one is the physical one, but the reference one has certain, uh, certain conveniences. So for that reason, it's also meaningful and really profitable, let me say, to eventually um, express the balanced laws on the reference configuration as well. And in doing so, what we will need eventually is a stress tensor. In fact, there isn't only one, there are several. Uh, that also somehow live in the reference configuration, similar to how we wanted to uh, express the mass balance in the reference configuration, and we uh, identified or defined a referential density, right? So that's our purpose now. We're done pretty much with everything regarding balance laws, but everything we did so far was in the, um, except for the mass balance, everything was in the spatial configuration. So now we will revisit linear and angular momentum balance, and we'll try to develop the referential forms. Okay. And uh, for that, I will again revert to, for this purpose, revert to a concept that we already know from undergraduate mechanics. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a bar, and I'm going to pull on that bar with a force F. <coughs> 
and this will be the reference configuration of the bar. On the reference configuration, if I take a cross section, there will be a certain referential area, let's say capital A associated with that cross section. And now when I pull the bar, and we've done this experiment in our undergraduate mechanics course, right? You do a tensile test, your specimen is not exactly of that shape, but eventually at least the gauge portion that you're monitoring, eventually you know, will be subjected to some uh, necking phenomena, and this specimen will deform into a, another shape, right? It will get longer, and it will also have this neck forming. Okay. So that's not the best drawing, but okay. So that's now the new uh, form. The force is not necessarily the same, right? Um, now, but what I like to imagine is uh, essentially the concept, or I like to imagine this, these two figures to be the referential and spatial representations of the same object. So don't think of it of this as being an initial force that is smaller than that force. I keep increasing the force and it deforms. Yes, that's how this deformation occurs. But when I draw these pictures, I like to think of it this way. There is the, the current and the referential configurations. And there is a certain physical force. The physical force is always the one that is associated with the spatial configuration. That's, there's a force that I apply. And I'm also drawing that force just for graphical purposes on this configuration as well. Yes, this configuration is the undeformed one, but I'm indicating the force there anyway. Okay? So now, once I have these two fixtures, and of course, the area is getting smaller, and now on the Deformed configuration, the spatial one, the cross-sectional area in the rectangular region is uh, smaller. Let's indicate that with small a. So now you will remember that there are two stress fields or stress values that we talked about. Uh, we talked about the engineering stress, but then we said, well, in reality, the cross-sectional area is getting smaller, and therefore, uh, the true stress, right, is not force divided by the original area, but actually the deformed area. And the engineering stress that we found convenient to work with, uh, because we often assume that the deformations are small, uh, simply omits the fact that the, uh, the cross-section area is subject to a significant change and always divides by the original area, the referential area A. Right? But in this course, we're not going to make any such assumption in general. We will allow deformations to be large. Okay? So even in 1D, now what we can do is we can simply divide right, through A, multiply with A, and now I notice this part to be the true stress, and the remaining part is a ratio of the areas in the original and deformed configurations. So what we see from here, the message is not really the, these particular forms, but rather the fact that if I want to define a measure of stress on the reference configuration, sort of, right? There's a force, but I'm dividing through an area on the reference configuration, or dividing through an area on the deformed configuration, right? These things are related to one another through the knowledge of deformation. That's the message here. Okay, so if I know how deformation occurs, I can relate alternate descriptions or definitions of the stress. So knowledge of deformation allows relating sigma to sigma tilde. Um, and one more message is the following. Yes, now when I um, define these stresses in this manner, the meaning is very clear. Force per unit area, which area undeformed or deformed one. But for mathematical purposes, when I just look at these relations, I don't directly see those definitions. I see one definition that is related to another definition through a measure of deformation. So what I could do is, what I could do is mathematically is, I could go ahead with this type of relation and define a new stress, okay? For instance, I could define a new stress sigma hat, okay? This one was tilde, which is related to sigma tilde, okay? Not, right? 
like this, but in some other fashion. I'm just making up. Why not like this? Okay. There isn't a linear relation, but there is a quadratic relation, right? Now, does this mean anything? Probably not, okay? You can plug it in and it probably doesn't mean anything, but we can define it. And if it has a purpose, and if it is meaningful, at least in terms of mathematics and manipulations, it is convenient and meaningful to define such a new term. Now, you haven't seen such a new term yet, or such a stress, tense, stress value description uh, before in your undergraduate mechanics, but in what we're about to develop, uh, we will introduce such stress measures, and the meaning and usefulness of such stress uh, definitions will become more apparent in upcoming weeks. So the second message here is that we could build um, other stress measures um, without, I will say, physical meaning. It, or at least, if you want, a better way to put this would be without any immediate physical meaning. All right, so that is now going to be our purpose. Uh, we're going to first proceed by defining um, new stress um, descriptions. Okay, so now for that purpose, I will go ahead and draw, repeat our favorite picture of a general reference configuration which is related to a current configuration through the motion. I'm going to take a cut. Of course, after deformation, that cross section is going to deform in some general manner. But let us concentrate for a second on a area of infinitesimal size, let's say of size D capital A, with normal capital N. And after deformation, that infinitesimal area will have a new size, D small a, and a new normal N. And what you will remember at this stage is that those infinitesimal areas together with the normal are related to one another. So let us write it like this. That was fine. And dA is F cofactor capital N dA. And this is what we called nonsense formula. This is what we derived as the Nansen's formula, okay? Where F cofactor, again, remember, is J F minus transpose, okay? So if I know the motion, I know the deformation gradient, and I know exactly how that map occurs. Now, additionally, at that given point, at this point that I'm uh, monitoring, I have a traction. So I'm looking at a certain point at a given time, and there is a certain normal, and that normal allows me to calculate the value of the traction through the stress field. Okay. And let's draw the norm of the traction here as well. The traction is not necessarily right, normal to the surface. <coughs> OK. Now, once you complete writing, just Put your pencils down for a second. Let's do this together quickly, and then I'll give you a chance to write. Okay, so now 
there is a traction that's like force per unit area and there is an infinitesimal area. If I multiply this force per unit area with the infinitesimal area, I get an infinitesimal force. Let me call that force df. Okay, so it's t times d. And of course, t is nothing but tn. Right? So I have that incremental force equals T and DA. And this is a force that acts on the current configuration, right? Now, it's a force. If I resolve that force per unit area of the deformed configuration, I get a traction, which is T, right? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to resolve it per unit area of the undeformed configuration, okay? So instead of writing T, therefore, if I resolve it per unit area of the undeformed configuration, I better put something else here, right? Because it's not equal to dA, right? So I'm going to put P, okay? That's now another object. Now, what you should notice is that eventually I'm resolving the same force. This force itself is a Eulerian object, right? It has bases that live or components that live on that configuration. And therefore, this is now also a vector that does live on the current configuration. But when I'm defining it, I'm defining it per unit area of the reference configuration. So this has no basis, etc., and therefore this still preserves the configuration that DF is associated with. So this is still uh, acts, still a force which physically acts on R. It is in the same direction as T. But only its magnitude is different. So P is something that is aligned with T, but it is of different magnitude, smaller or larger, depending on how small DA is associated with capital DA. Um, OK, so if T is equal to TI EI, then P is equal to also PI EI. Right? And from these two relations, I find that P is equal to T D small a over d capital A. So you may want to momentarily compare that expression over here with this one, okay? So T here is the Cauchy stress. It's the original thing. It's like the true stress, okay? Or it's like the true traction. And now P is like a engineering traction. It's something else. There is a distinct, right? Uh, relation between the ten, between them, and there is a clear physical interpretation of both of them. Incremental force resolved on either one of the configurations. All right. So now, recall that the old traction, the original traction, is some stress tensor multiplying a normal. So now I ask myself, well, is there a stress tensor from which I can recover this new traction vector? perhaps by operating on the referential outward unit normal and not the spatial one. So that is the question that I want to answer now. Okay? And why don't you write that much as I clean up the board? Okay, so the goal is to construct a new stress sensor. And again, I'd like to ask for your attention just for a, for a few minutes again. And so I, to, to, to accomplish the goal that I just stated, I'll begin with the expression of the incremental force. So this is one incremental force. And it is eventually going to be equal to the resolution of that incremental for force per unit area on the reference configuration. So these two are the same things. Now, the traction is Cauchy's stress times outward unit normal to the current configuration dA. But and dA, I already know how it's mapped to the referential configuration. So instead of and dA, I am going to write F cofactor capital at dA. 
So this is through nonsense formula. And now that, of course, is equal to PDA, right? So therefore, now when I look, right? So when I look here, I see T is Tn, right? And when I look here, I see that there is a new object here that relates P to a new tensor. And that new tensor is right here. Okay. Just like the Cauchy stress tensor operates on the outward unit normal to the current configuration and delivers me what the original traction is, now I have a new tensor that operates on the outward unit normal to the reference configuration and delivers me this new definition of traction, right? And this quantity is what we are going to call P. So P is eventually going to be called the first pure Kirchhoff stress tensor. I'm going to write down what, it, what the, the name for it once again, but the, currently our observation is that P is now a quantity, okay? And because eventually I have made use of the reference configuration, I will prefer the Lagrangian form. So I will, as the position coordinate, pick the referential configuration. At a given time, at a given position associated with a given particle, along a given normal to the reference configuration, it's equal to the a new stress field, the new stress field, which depends only on position and time, and the normal is again outside. So this is now our new expression. Now notice, right, again I highlight, this is a force, incremental force on the current configuration. So is this, and therefore P is something spatial. This is spatial. This is referential. So in order to take something from the reference configuration and throw it to the current configuration, I better have a two-point tensor that allows that mapping. Okay? So P must have the form, which you can also from, see from here by doing explicit manipulations, and I leave that to you. P must be of the form PIA, EI bon, EA. Okay? Um, so that is referential. So now, um, T is called, so far, just the traction, right? But from now on, I'd like to, when possible, and especially in this context, make a difference between the two. So I'm going to call this the Cauchy traction. And the reason is simply because it's related to the Cauchy stress tensor. Okay. Now, on the other hand, I will call P to be the Piola traction. And the tensor itself is called the first Piola Kirchhoff stress. And sometimes I'll just write first PK to make uh, the writing a little bit less cumbersome. Okay? So, this is our new stress tensor. So please write that much, and then we'll continue on with the discussion. So clearly, there is a reason why we attach the prefix first to the piola kirchhoff stress tensor, because there are others. Uh, notably, there's a second Piola-Kirchhoff stress tensor that I'm going to mention at the end of this lecture. All right, so now that we have um, a new stress tensor, um, we clearly have not done it just for the sake of it. Uh, it's going to help us accomplish our goal of stating the balanced laws in local referential form, okay? So let's get on with that task. So first of all, um, P is equal to TF cofactor. F cofactor is JF minus transpose, transpose, 
transpose, I'm sorry, uh, which I'm you know, directly plugging in here. And therefore, what you may also wish to do is express t in terms of j, and you're going to have 1 over j p f transpose. Okay? So now, once you have that expression uh, drive or, or expressing the local form of angular momentum balance via a referential quantity is very easy because angular momentum balance simply says in local form that t is symmetric. t is 1 over j p f transpose and that is supposed to be equal to t transpose and that is 1 over j f p transform, transpose. So uh, the requirement on P, right, that is a requirement on P, and that requirement is that P F transpose for any given F be equal to F P transpose. Okay? So that is the local, I will say referential um, form of angular momentum um, balance. I'm not going to go ahead and explicitly state the integral referential form of angular momentum balance. You can do that on the side yourself, but I will do so for the linear momentum balance, and that will give you a guide. Actually, the transition is very simple. So for the linear momentum balance, Uh, what I can do is first state the linear momentum balance, right? I have rate of change of the total linear momentum in the body. And that is equal to the net force, which is due to the volume and surface forces. Um, so now, when I look at these three terms, right, and just, just have a look here for a second. When I look at these three terms, right, so I can make transition. So my goal is to make a transition to the referen reference configurations, domain and surface-wise, right? Uh, now, this one is accomplished directly by the definition of what uh, it means for P to be a referential traction or polar traction, right? So this is simply integral P D capital A. And immediately I have pulled back the integral to the refer referential uh, surface. For this, I really don't need to do anything. It's going to be rho not D capital M V. And for this one as well, let me do it for this one. It's similar for that. It's D D T integral R not rho not V D capital V. Okay. Uh, now, of course, to derive the local forms, that is not sufficient. That's just the integral form. For that, I need to move the derivative inside, and I need to convert this to a volume integral. Now, this, now let's start with that one, because that's super easy. In fact, we've already done that. So because everything is referential, I can just move the time derivative here inside. And this is going to be equal to r naught rho naught v dot d capital V. And on the other hand, to convert this to a volume integral, now I have the relation which says that the Piola traction is the Piola, first Piola Kirchhoff stress tensor times n, to which now I can apply the divergence theorem. But now when I apply the divergence theorem, notice that I'm on the reference configuration. This is a referential outward unit normal. And therefore, the divergence is going to be a referential divergence, right? So this whole thing is going to be integral over the reference configuration, capital divergence, right? Derivatives with respect to referential coordinates of the first purely Kirchhoff stress tensor. And integration is over the volume. And hence, one obtains, which I will squeeze here, right? Divergence of P plus rho naught B, which would be the conversion of this integral to the referential form, is equal to rho naught 
Okay. So that would be the referential local form of linear momentum balance. Okay, so we're pretty much done. Uh, let me just summarize the local forms of the balanced laws together. I think at the start it's always easier to recall the integral forms because the meaning is very clear, whereas the local forms are um, more mathematical right? um, expressions. But eventually, the local forms are the ones that are the starting points for, in particular, um, numerical implementations. So one needs to clearly learn them. Um, so we have the mass balance, linear momentum balance, and the angular momentum balance. And for each one of those, We have the referential and the spatial forms. Okay, they are entirely equivalent. It's just different expressions of the same idea. Well, the mass balance uh, says in local form rho dot plus rho divergence v is equal to zero. Okay. Um, the linear momentum balance says that divergence of t plus rho b is equal to rho v dot. And the angular momentum balance essentially puts a constraint on the Cauchy stress tensor. And it says that it must be symmetric. Okay. The referential forms are I'm just going to write it like this. When I was discussing the mass balance, I told you this is not per se a balanced law. The balanced law really says that rho naught is a constant in time. But this is the expression that I'm writing. It's useful to recall this relation. Um, then now we have the linear momentum balance in local form. And finally, the constraint on the first piola kirchhoff stress tensor, which is directly associated with the symmetry of the Cauchy stress tensor. Okay. So when you look at these expressions, right, for instance, what you can do is you can concentrate on the left column, which is a well, this is a constraint, right, which you can actually, it turns out, easily satisfy. And we're going to see how that comes about. Eventually, I have two differential equations, right? It's not all that different here. In fact, it's somewhat easier. Uh, you have one differential equation. Um, what one should realize that it's not always possible to pick the configuration on which you're going to work. This is a matter of convenience. So what I can tell you is, if you're a fluid mechanician, you are going to actually live on the current configuration, because for most common fluid problems, the concept of a reference configuration is not even well defined. right? But this is a solid mechanics oriented course. And for solid mechanics, often one chooses the reference configuration. Not always, but it's a common and convenient and certainly a possible choice. Okay? Uh, so they're equivalent. But if you look at either one, there, there are some differential equations and possibly some constraints. If you want to solve such differential equations, you see that there is some spatial and time derivatives. And in order to solve them, you need to specify or complement these with appropriate initial and boundary conditions. Okay? So these are all subject to appropriate initial and boundary conditions. Because together, they define an initial boundary value problem. We're not going to uh, 
busy ourselves with the statement and the solution of such problems in this course. But if you are interested, that's what you have to do. You have to be careful um, about the boundary conditions and the initial ones. All right. We're in pretty good shape. Are we happy with this picture so far? I give you the equations. You code them using your favorite numerical method, and you solve them, right? Yes? Maybe? Hopefully. Hopefully. OK. Well, the question is, can you? So in other words, can we actually solve these equations? Is this all the information that I need together with these additional stuff? Okay, And let, let's think about that for a second, actually, which is going to link us to uh, at least one of the special topics that we are going to cover in upcoming weeks. So let's concentrate on the spatial forms. We could do it with the um, referential ones as well. But the spatial one uh, is the one I will pick presently. So let's pick the uh, spatial form. And I'm going to assume that somehow I can take care of the symmetry of the Cauchy stress tensor a priori. Somehow I can satisfy it. So I don't need to worry about that, which is indeed the case. Okay? So assume T is symmetric. Okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a simple count. If you want to solve anything, you better have enough equations for your number of unknowns. So I'm going to count the number of unknowns. And I'm going to count the number of equations. Um, and let us do that together. Well, the number of unknowns, first of all, I need everything intrinsically has this deformation gradient appearing. And that, and eventually I have the acceleration as well in there through the velocity. So therefore, the motion itself is certainly something that is unknown. It's a vectorial field. Let me, in this case, I wrote it as a referential form. Uh, it has three components and therefore three unknowns. I need to figure out what the density is, right? I'm just counting the unknowns, right? Density changes with time. At a given position, at a given time, it will evolve, right? Things will get compressed, stretched, etc. So that's certainly one unknown. And plus, I need to, as a result, find what the stress is. And I assume that it's symmetric already. And therefore, there are six independent components. I sum them up, and there are, uh, there are 10 unknowns. Okay? Then I count the number of equations that I have. Well, that's straightforward. I have the mass balance, which is one equation. It's a scalar equation. Plus, I have the linear momentum balance. Linear momentum balance is a vectorial equation, right? Divergence of t is a vector, rho b is a vector, rho v dot is a vector, so it's a vectorial equation. So that has three equations overall. And how about the angular momentum balance? Well, I already made use of it when I invoke t to be symmetric. I don't need to worry about satisfying it anymore. I already made use of it. So um, overall, therefore, I have 1 plus 3, and hence I have only four equations. So clearly, uh, I'm not in great shape presently. So I have six missing equations. Okay. And the resolution to that dilemma, of course, as you will remember from undergraduate mechanics, is to somehow relate motion to forces, or in this case, to stress. So what we must do is we must relate Kinetics to kinematics. So in this case, when I talk about kinematics, so things will move and rotate. When things only rotate, that I know that I'm not going to get omitting inertia, right? I'm just talking about the deformation of the material. When it only rotates, I know that I shouldn't get 
any stress. And indeed, the strain concept has been designed to filter out any rotation, right? So when I talk about kinematics, I want to talk about strain. And I want to link it to a natural measure of the forces that develop within the body point-wise, which happens through the stress field. So I want to relate kinematics to uh, kinetics through stress and strain. And indeed, you will remember in your undergraduate mechanics that a way to do that, and there isn't only one way, in undergraduate mechanics, for instance, when we were talking about solid materials that undergo small elastic deformations, right? That's a very specific set of instructions for us to follow in relating stress to strain. So when we have that very specific scenario, we could make that relation through generalized Hooke's law, which says that, and I'm going to here without discussion follow standard undergraduate notation, one would write stress as a vector. It's already symmetric, so it has six independent components. In void form, for instance, you would write them as a vector. And now on the right-hand side, you have a strain. Again, everything is put. It's also symmetric, um, at least in, the, uh, in our versions as well, but certainly in the undergraduate one. So it's a six by one vector. And the most general way to relate a vector to a vector is to throw in a set tensor, or in this case, a matrix in between. And which we call to be the stiffness matrix, that would be a six by six metric, and eventually it has 21 independent components, etc. Um, right? So that would be the relation. Right? So now what I've done is I've thrown in right six additional equations that relate the six components of the stress to the components of the strain, which says that. Well, the only way to get stress is if you have a non-zero strain in the material. Okay? And to get a non-zero strain, it's not sufficient that you rotate. You have to do something else. You have to pull or you have to shear, etc. So this is where your additional equations come from. But this is just, and we need to realize that, this is just an example. Depending on how much the material deforms, depending on how it deforms, whether it's elastic or inelastic, and depending on whether the material itself is a fluid or a solid or something fancy in between, uh, these expressions will change. But one way or the other, what you have to remember is that you need to relate stress to strain and related things, like the rate of strain, etc. Okay, How fast the strain changes. Remember, for instance, if you have viscoelasticity, it's not the only amount of strain that influences the stress. It's how fast you apply that strain, for instance. But in the end, Kinetics should be related to kinematics. And always, you will get these six additional equations that give you closure. And now, you have a well-defined system of equations. Okay? We're going to eventually discuss partially those as well in our special topics. Um, so with this additional information, I know precisely how to attack those set of equations. I have a well-defined system, and I can uh, solve for it. All right? Any questions so far? OK, then. What I'll do is uh, just also, as promised, define a few other stress fields. So, so far, I've introduced the uh, pure peak of stress tensor, and the reason was that it naturally leads to the expression of, in particular, the linear momentum balance in local form, as well as the integral forms in uh, referential form. Um, so, now all of these eventually arise out of some sort of need. Those needs we will not perhaps encounter or have a chance to discuss all of them, uh, but, but at least some of them you will encounter. So one can introduce other stress um, measures. And the first one is, um, it's not as common as the other one that I'm about to mention, but it's simply the Jacobian of deformation times the Cauchy stress tensor. Okay. Very simple definition. This is called the, simply the Kirchhoff stress tensor. 
Now, the Kikov stress tensor has a very practical um, uh, purpose, and it often is used in that manner. So if you have some integral containing the Cauchy stress tensor, now, there might be other quantities in here. It doesn't matter. Okay? So I didn't put them. Uh, if you have some integral containing the Cauchy stress tensor, so now this is T dV. But small infinitesimal volume is J times capital infinitesimal volume. And J times T is the Kirchhoff stress tensor. And therefore, now you have immediately an integral over the reference configuration where instead of uh, the Cauchy stress, there appears the Kirchhoff stress tensor. Okay? So that is a practical need for the Kirchhoff stress tensor. Simplifies uh, expressions a tiny bit. But that's not the only one. In fact, there is another one that is very uh, useful, and it's defined like this. And as you might guess, um, this was the first Piola Kirchhoff stress tensor, and this is going to be the second Piola Kirchhoff stress tensor. And um, from this expression here, it's not clear what the purpose or um, particular form is, in fact, the purpose is not going to become apparent anyway at this stage. We'll discuss it in the weeks to come. Uh, but what you can show is that S is actually symmetric. Okay. So the Cauchy stress tensor is symmetric. The Piola, first Piola Kirchhoff stress tensor is not symmetric. If you do this, the second one is a symmetric tensor. Why is that? Well, because P is equal to uh, J T F cofactor. Okay, so F inverse and P is J T F cofactor, which is or it's J F minus transpose transposes F cofactor, right? So and now you notice from here that if I transpose both sides, I still have the same form. Uh, and alternatively, just like we did before, you can express the Cauchy stress tensor in terms of the second Piola Kirchhoff stress tensor, and it would have this nice expression T is equal to 1 over J FSF transpose. Okay, so now with this, what we've done is we've finished now the first part of the course, right? In the first part of the course, we covered mathematical preliminaries, which build the basis, mathematical basis, and also introduce many new operations, objects. We talked about tensors, how to manipulate them, how to work with them, how to analyze and characterize them, etc. Um, and then we moved on to the discussion of kinematics, right? How things move and deform, how we define those. Uh, and we discuss many things like material time derivative, etc. And then once we understood that together with a discussion of strain, etc., characterization of extent of deformation, we moved on to balanced laws. And within that, we discussed kinetics um, and how we can relate motion to deformation at the body level, right, in terms of balanced laws, right? And there we discussed um, uh, also always local and referential forms because eventually they will be useful. And in the future, if you are interested in, a fur in further, uh, uh, let me say, uh, learning this topic, uh, depending on your field of interest, you will find one form or the other more useful probably than the other one. Um, so, um, so what we've done, the way the course is structured, and it's a good point to remind you that of that structure at this point, the way the course is structured is to, was to cover this first part, 
in as concise a manner, I would say, as possible. So I try to make as little as excursion as possible into the into side issues, like for instance, once in a while I discuss open versus closed system, or I would measure, let's say, some time derivative in the context of a ALE framework, et cetera. But those were really, really side issues, and many possibly important things like objectivity or, uh, I don't know, um, uh, perhaps some tensorial operations. Uh, some of the things perhaps deserve more attention than I found a chance to uh, provide here. But the structure of the course is such that now, since many of you will never have a chance to, or will not perhaps uh, um, be interested maybe in um, pursuing continuum mechanics further, what I want to do is instead of going into the depths of particular intricacies, I want to show you how this machinery helps us uh, formulate problems that you are already familiar with and also how it will eventually help us attack some problems perhaps you're not familiar with, but I will be able to communicate to you the idea of line of attack very, let me say, um, um, efficiently through the language of continuum mechanics so that you understand how continuum mechanics becomes useful eventually, right? Uh, so this is, for some of you, your only chance of understanding and seeing, learning about continuum mechanics, and within that chance, I'd like to make use of uh, uh, also, or I'd I like to make use of a possibility for demonstrating you of the usefulness, right? And therefore, the second part from now on is going to be on applications, okay? And there are a number of applications which proceed in a, I would say, rather systematic, through a systematic choice. So first, Right? What are we trying to do with all of this? We want to analyze how things move and deform. So let's start with the simplest thing. Right? What if the thing itself does not move, deform at all? It just moves. So that would be rigid body dynamics. So that's what we are going to start next. Um, so you're going to see how equations of motion that you already know emanate from the framework of continuum mechanics as some particular case where we know exactly what the motion is because the rigid body motion, pure rotation and translation, it can be an arbitrarily sized and shaped object, but we'll make use of the balance laws, et cetera, okay, in doing so. So that will be the first one. And the equations we get are not any different from what you already know, but they will be in 3D, and now you understand where all these tensors or the matrices that you had seen before come from, et cetera. And uh, then we will say, well, OK, let's allow it to deform, OK? But a little bit. So we're going to look at small deformations. And then we're going to say, well, OK, let's allow it to deform a lot. So we're going to look at large deformations, et cetera. So step by step, eventually, I want to mention a little bit fl fluids and so on. So in this fashion, hopefully, you will see how the power of continuum mechanics, language itself, shows itself in effectively communicating all of these various and uh, rich um, topics in a very concise manner. So it's, it's hopefully going to be an um, enjoyable ride. Okay, so from the uh, next lecture on, we're going to start with the set of special uh, topics into the second part of the course. Okay. All right, so that's the plan. So I'll see you next week.